um, Dr. De Silva uh, from the University of Sydney, Australia, please. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to give this presentation here. Um, so why am I interested in resilience and susceptibility? Um, I think it's quite important to understand uh, what happens in these two disease states. Uh, one, when we're diagnosing, diagnost when we're developing diagnostic tests, and the other one is for vaccine development. So I hope you will agree with me by the end of the talk that really understanding um, these two disease states can be quite important. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. So for those of you who may not know this disease, paratuberculosis or Yone's disease is caused by uh, Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis. Uh, like TB, it's a very slow progressing chronic disease. Uh, the histopathology shows a granulomatous inflammation of intestinal tissues. Um, and you can see by all these uh, pictures I've got around on that slide that these, uh, that ruminants are the main host for this pathogen. And the disease impact is um, reduced production, so weight loss and reduced milk yield. And we know that um, not all exposed animals will get infection, and there are varying de degrees of susceptibility or varying de degrees of disease states in these animals, both in sheep and in cattle. So um, I'm going to talk about two main experimental infection trials that we've carried out at the University of Sydney. So we initially developed a, a model um, uh, to try and understand this disease where the lambs are given three oral doses when they are about three to four months of age. And then we take blood fe and fecal samples and weigh these animals at regular intervals um, until we see clinical disease or weight loss in some of the animals. And at necropsy, we take a range of intestinal um, and extra intestinal tissues to really try and identify, ca to characterize the disease. Oops, sorry, going the wrong way. So um, these are some pictures to show you how we carry out the uh, experimental trials in Sydney. Um, we hold our animals outside in quarantine paddocks. So we have control animals in a separate area and the exposed map exposed animals in a separate area. It's a really big team effort on the days um, that we carry out these trials because we can have, um, we've, we've had up to 200 sheep in one trial. Um, so the, at the end of the trial as well, it's a very busy day in the post-mortem room where we have people um, dissecting the animals, others taking out gut tissues and then separating them out for the various um, molecular and histopathological um, analyses that we do. So just to clarify what I'm going to mean by these words when I talk about the results in a little while. So clinical disease, as I said, is um, loss of body weight. Um, if we say an animal is infected, if at the end of the trial we get viable bacteria back from the intestinal tissues, or we can see uh, histopathological lesions in these animals. Uh, I say that an animal is infectious if we are able to detect viable MAP, so by fecal culture, at any time point that we have tested, keeping in mind that shedding in this disease is intermittent. Um, and resilience is when we don't see any um, viable map in the intestines at the end of the trial. So we've given the animals a chance to recover or to overcome the disease. So the first trial I'm going to talk about is the longest trial that we've ever done, where we held these animals for two and a half years to see if animals would really succumb to disease or not. Unfortunately, because of funding issues, we could not hold these animals for any longer. So two and a half years was the longest we could. And this just shows you the survival curve. So the MB stands for multibacillary, which is one end of the disease spectrum, where in the lesions you see all these acid fast organisms in intestinal tissues. So all the little pinky stains is the mycobacteria. The PB stands for post bacillary, where again, these animals can have clinical disease, um, but you don't see as many acid fast bacilli or none at all. And it's a very um, lymphocytic lesion. 
So you can see at about one year, we had our first case of clinical disease, and stepwise, we had to remove several animals during the trial. And at the end, at two and a half years, we had 11 animals that survived, so didn't have clinical disease, so we didn't take them out of the trial. But there was this one animal that was multibacillary, that was shedding a lot of bacteria in its feces, but did not lose weight. So what we don't know is obviously if we kept it for two or three months more, whether it would have started losing weight. So the first thing of interest is infectiousness. So I'm showing you a timeline um, in this grid chart and these colored kind of, um, I don't even know how to describe, maybe olive green brown type boxes is where we got a, a positive fecal culture. And these hashed boxes are where the animals were necropsied and taken out of the trial. So the clear boxes, no fecal shedding. So these are the diseased animals. And you can see that most of them become persistent shedders. So we sample these every uh, month at the later stages. And every month, these animals shed bacteria. But the interesting thing is that we had this group of animals that were resilient. So there were 11 animals that were uninfected at um, two and a half years. Um, and in this group, there was a very small subset, so just four animals that we were unable to detect shedding at all at any of these multiple time points that we looked at. There were some that were what I'm calling transient shedders. So they shed very early on, and then they had nothing happening at all. So if we look at MAP-specific antibodies, because this is a diagnostic test, and this is just a commercial kit test that we purchased, it's a very busy graph, but I just want you to look at this early section here. So this is up to 20 weeks. Um, and the black squares here are the resilient animals. So though it wasn't significantly different to the um, infected animals, there is this kick of an antibody response in the, in the group of animals that become resilient. And you can, oops, you do see this um, later on um, at the end of the trial as well. So, uh, sorry, so we, all, so we looked at the difference between what I'm calling the resilient infectious and non-infectious groups, and really there is no um, difference at all. At a few time points, there were significant differences, but I don't think um, that's biologically relevant. If you look at the infrared gamma response, again, another very busy slide because there are all these disease groups, but I'm really interested up here in this early response because I'm looking for an early diagnostic marker. And again, you can see the black, um, the, sorry, the, the squares have this early uh, kick, and these are the resilient animals. And if we look at just that early time point and look at association with disease at two and a half years uh, into the future, you can see that there is um, a trend that the resilient animals do have this higher interferon gamma response. And in another trial that we have already published, which I'm not showing here, you can actually see that the higher the early interferon gamma response is, the less likely an animal is going to be infected at 12 months. So I think there is some potential in there, but we really need to understand what this means. So this was the reason I asked the breed question in the previous talk, because we looked at um, what happens in the different breeds, and we looked at three different breeds. Um, the merinos are anecdotally known to be the most susceptible. So we had merinos and a few other breeds, and the black arrows are pointing to the clinically diseased animals. And in some of them, visually, they look no different to the other animals. We knew that they were clinical disease we were, because we were weighing these animals individually. So what um, do their disease states look like? So, so I should also mention that this was a 12-month trial. Um, because this was a very large trial and we couldn't keep the animals for any longer. So we can see clinical disease, the weight loss is highest in the merinos and is lowest in the Paul Dorset breed. Um, the distribution of lesions is not that different, 57 to 42% across the intestinal tissues. So when we look at disseminated disease, so we look at... Um, viable map in the liver of these animals. And again, we can see that the merinos have a higher rate of dissemination than the Paul Dorset. So ov overall, there seems to be a difference between the breeds. But what I found most interesting was when we looked at the quantity of the pathogen in the feces of these different breeds um, at the end point, so when they were all shedding, 
the Paul Dorsets, even though there were only a few animals that were shedding, the quantity they were shedding was similar to the merinos. So I think though we can say that you know, there are differences in susceptibility, there doesn't seem to be a lot of difference in infectiousness of these animals. So immune responses are what I'm really interested in. And if we looked at interferon gamma, again, the um, purple is the Paul Dorset animals. And you can see that they have this really high interferon gamma kick early on. So this is at three months post-infection, uh, post-exposure compared to the other breeds. So again, um, to me, this is a link between the interferon gamma response and um, disease susceptibility, perhaps. If we look at the antibody responses, and this is just in the animals that lost weight and at that final time point before they were necropsied. Um, and this line here shows you the positive diagnostic cutoff. So you can see that in the pole dorsets, which visually don't look diseased, um, most of them will come up negative with the antibody test. So um, again, I think it's important to take breed into consideration when we look at diagnostic tests. So this is my little map of what I think happens in paratuberculosis from all these different trials we've done. So if we start off with an animal that gets exposed, it goes through this non-infectious state. It becomes transiently infectious. This can, one arm can pro uh, progress to persistent infectiousness, and then you go on to get disease or clinical disease, and this can be multi and possibly But these transiently infectious animals can go down this pathway shown by the thicker blue line where they can become infectious, uh, sorry, become non-infectious and resilient. And what are the immune markers that are important? I think it's this early inter antibody and early interferon gamma response. So I think when we do an antibody ELISA for um, diagnosis, we need to be aware of perhaps the age of the animal um, as well. Uh, so another arm of this work is actually looking at gene expression um, changes in these animals. And so these are results from the two and a half year trial uh, where we took uh, uh, blood samples from two weeks until um, two and a half weeks after exposure, and we carried out microarray analysis on a subset of the animals, and we looked at gene changes that were either up or down regulated at every single time point in the same way. So we're looking for a pattern here. And what we find is that we have these um, sets of genes that you find in the diseased animals. Um, so if you put the multis and the porsies together, I'm calling them diseased because really a farmer is not interested in what type of disease the animal has. But very importantly, there is this group of genes that seem to be differentially regulated in the resilient animals. So I think there is um, some potential to carry this, out, this work out into the future. So in conclusion, um, what I think based on our experimental trials is that these early interferon gamma and antibody responses are markers of resilience. Um, we need to be careful when we're losing the antibody test to diagnose disease. I think we need to combine it with the fecal culture test, and I think uh, a lot of diagnostic um, guidelines do do that already, which is great. And I think gene expression is another way into the future to try and really understand this disease. So finally, I would like to thank um, the UNS disease team at the University of St Sydney. Many staff and students have gone through this lab. And of course, um, the livestock industry in Australia, which um, funds our research. Thank you. Okay.